I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. We have been away from this uh, text for uh, uh, a couple of months now. And uh, about in November, we uh, were last uh, looking at it, and then we got away to look at some of the biblical uh, things on the birth of Christ. So in Matthew chapter 5, we want to pick up. And on the screen, you can see uh, we're going to talk about uh, you have my word on this. And then it has a guy uh, standing on the screen. And maybe you can't see the lower part of the screen, but he's got his hand up in the air. And, and on the back side, he's doing this. He's crossing his fingers and giving his word. And sometimes in our society, we say, oh, but I, but I had my fingers crossed. You know, you, you tell them something and, and you think, well, I, it wasn't the truth because I, I crossed my fingers on it. And you go, really? Well, what did you say? Because our word is uh, ought to be our, our bond. And so in this passage, Jesus is going to deal with our word and what we have to, to say about our word. Now, let me do this. Let's go back and review just a little bit. We started in uh, Matthew 5 back in June, and we were just looking at the the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, and and we worked our way through those Beatitudes. And then that went through verse 12, and then we decided, well, we'll continue on there and on the Sermon uh, on the Mount. Now, here's what happens as we started that last June. Uh, For instance, uh, we have a luncheon today, and I think there are... Uh, six new families that at our luncheon time that that Audrey and I and a couple of the staff people get the chance to be with, and so when those people come into our church and they're new to church, they haven't had the last few months that you have, and you've forgotten the last few months anyway, right? And so they don't know. For instance, uh, if they um, have a, a lot of church background, they'll they'll know. Oh, okay, the Sermon on the Mount, that's Jesus, and that's probably Matthew. And but maybe they don't know that. So let me just give you some background on that, so it'll refresh your memory if you've been with us, and if you are new to us, then you go, oh, okay, that's where the Sermon on the Mount is. So let's do this. Let's go to the screen and let's have the globe there for a second. And I'm just going to hold it there for a second because I want you to see where Jesus is preaching this sermon on the mount it's his longest written sermon in scripture and when you look at the the globe that that i have turned towards you it's really the other side of the earth for us cuz you can see that the mediterranean is kind of right in the middle and just above that you have the continent of europe so i'll just put it there and then just below the uh, europe you have that in the mediterranean sea and below that you have the continent of africa of course, Africa is a really, it's a large continent and some uh, 4,000 miles from the, the top of it to the bottom of it. And it has tons of countries. And, and sometimes you may need to review some of those countries because they change names every so often. And they decide, you know, somebody fights and takes it over and it, it's got a name change. And then uh, some tribe fights in a given area and they split. And part of it is one name now and part of it's another name now. So we've had a lot of new countries Uh, come into existence out of Africa. Just east of all of that is the continent of Asia. So let me put it there. So you have all these three just kind of colliding. They're they're kind of like a, a wheel that has a hub. And let me put the hub right there. And the hub is where Jesus decided to be born. So I'll just put it right there because he's right in the middle because he knows He's got his chosen people right there. And he knows that if he's ministering there, he can minister to those in Europe and those in Asia and those in Africa. And then it gets all around the world. Now, what I've highlighted there in that little box is bigger than Israel uh, right now on the map there. It has a little bit of Egypt and a little bit of Saudi Arabia. And on the top side, a little bit of Turkey. But right in the, the middle of that, is Israel. So let's zoom in on that for a second. You can see where Jesus ministered, come right into the Jerusalem area, right to the left of Jerusalem was the Dead Sea. And then as you make your way up the Jordan River, you can see that little squiggly line making its way all the way up to the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee on the north side, you can see Capernaum and you can see the mountains on the north and we're turning in towards, you can see the mountains there a little bit in the background. And Jesus gave this sermon up on a mountain. So they called it the Sermon on the Mount. And for years, 
I mean, it, it, he didn't say, oh, by the way, just so you remember, this is called my Sermon on the Mount. And this is what it got referred to. And, and so people go, Sermon on the Mount? Where's that? So here's the Sermon on the Mount. Let's go to Matthew chapter 8 for a second. After he finished the Sermon on the Mount, which was Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, when he gets to chapter 8, here's how we know approximately where he gave the sermon. It says in verse 1, when he came down from the mountain, okay, so we, we got him in a mountain there. We know that's, that's easy to say. Oh, he's on some kind of mountain. Large crowds followed him. Right away, a man with a serious skin disease came up and knelt before him. Immediately, his disease was healed. When he entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him. So he's come down from the mountain, and where does he go? Into Capernaum. So we tie it in there and say, okay, here's where he is. Now, the Sermon on the Mount, where that, the mountain that was right there, the exact location, we don't know. But, of course, the, uh, the tourism of Israel, the Bureau of Tourism knows exactly where it was. Wink, wink, okay? Because people want to go to the Beatitudes, the, the, the Sermon on the Mount area where Jesus gave the Beatitudes. So there's an area that's right near the, uh, Capernaum uh, in the mountain area, and they call that the, where Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount. Let's go uh, to see side by side Matthew 5, 6, 7, and 7 and Luke chapter 6. Both Matthew and Luke have the Sermon on the Mount. However, obviously, Matthew, all of chapter 5, all 48 verses, all of chapter 6, chapter 7, it's going to be longer than Luke chapter 6, verses 20 to 49. So they weren't probably given at the same time, but they had portions in Luke. They have all of it in Matthew that we have. But let me show you why I think they weren't given at the same time, okay? Here's Matthew chapter 5 on the left-hand side of the screen. Here's Luke chapter 6 on the right-hand side of the screen. Matthew chapter 5. When he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to teach them. So this is the beginning of the sermon. And what's the whole purpose of the time there? To teach them. When you look at Luke chapter 6, during those days he went out to the mountain and what's he going to do? Go there to pray. So he has two different things that are going on, and yet some of the same verses are going to come up in Luke that came up in Matthew. Let me give you another reason we think it's different. Wipe it clean and just go back to the same verses. When he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. So apparently he's down in the, you know, in the lower area of Capernaum or something, and he goes up on the mountain. I showed you a picture when we first started this in in June, of that whole region there. And even one uh, YouTube clip where some guy was shouting, not shouting, he was reading scripture from the upper mountain area down against the lake. And you could see this, the, the little specks of people down near the lake. They were that far away. But you heard the recording where he was up there and they were recording it down below. And some uh, 7,000 people could fit easily in that area. So... Here, Matthew, he's going up on the mountain. But in Luke, verse 17, chapter 6, verse 17, after coming down with them, he stood on a level place. So one time he's going up and he's on the mountain and he's teaching them. One time he's coming down and he's speaking to them. So we think it's probably at different times. It's somewhat like me preaching the 8 o'clock service, preaching the 9.30 service, and then preaching the 11 o'clock service. I don't always say the same things. Yeah, they're pretty much the same, what you see on the screen. But in the first service, I didn't even mention that it, it's somewhat like me preaching the 8 o'clock or the 9.30 or the 11 o'clock service. So you use different things at, at different times. And Jesus probably in his teaching would have said, because he knows everybody's heart, right? I mean, it was, you walk up to him and he could say, I know what you're thinking. And he knows what you're thinking. How would you like to have a friend like that that knows everything you're thinking? You know, the, the, he's God, so he could know everything. But he, he walks he, up to him and he, he thinks, oh, in this, in this, I'm up on the mountain and this guy needs to hear this. 
When he comes down the valley, he says, oh, you know, there's a lady here that needs to hear this. And he could tailor make his messages. I can't do that. I don't know what you're thinking. You're th- yeah, you're thinking I'm nuts. No. <laughs> I don't know what you're thinking. But Jesus did. And so there are different times. So let's go to the text for a moment. Uh, as you end up chapter 7, when he's finishing the sermon. And here's what it says. When Jesus had finished this sermon, the crowds were astonished at his teaching because he was teaching them like one who had authority and not like their scribes. So what he's telling us is the scribes and Pharisees know how to do politically correct speech. They don't want to offend anybody, but Jesus would come at them and teach them with authority. In our society, our society doesn't like to have authority. They don't like the authority of the Word of God because the Word of God says this something is a sin. And they don't want to call anything wrong unless it knowingly hurts somebody. If they're killing people, then they'll say it's wrong. But if it's adultery, they don't, you know, it's, you know they made a mistake. If it's... Uh, homosexuality, oh, well, you know, they they soft soap it. Where God's word just comes right at it and says, you know, if you're a liar, it's wrong. If you're a murderer, it's wrong. If you're an adulterer, it's wrong. If you're practicing homosexuality, it's wrong. Now, all of those are sin, but all of them can be forgiven. And if somebody robs a bank and they end up in prison... They can get God's forgiveness, but they still have the consequences of being in prison for a while, especially if it's armed robbery. If they get out, we would treat them, and they got saved, we would treat them, you know, they've served their time, we're going to handle them. So Jesus comes at them with authority, the authority of the word. So let's look at this authority. Six times he says, you know, you've heard it said, but I'm going to tell you the truth. Because what was happening is what they had heard said was lowering the standard a little bit. And Jesus says, I'm going to raise the standard here. So six times he gives what we call an antithesis. There's a a thesis that they're making. This is what they say. And then he comes at them with an antithesis that changes everything. And he says, you thought the standard was here? The standard is way up here. As a matter of fact, Matthew 5.48 says, be ye perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. So the standard is perfection. And you can't keep it. So you can't get to heaven in your own, in your own strength. I'm going to make it for you, but you can't do it in your strength. Perfection is the standard. So in Matthew 5.21, he says, you have heard that it was said to our ancestors, do not murder, and whoever murders will be uh, subject to judgment. But I tell you, Everyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. You think murder's wrong? Hey, if you're angry, I want to hold you accountable. Let's let's love people. What's what's God calling us to do? Love one another. By this shall all men know you are my disciples if you love one another. He gives the world a standard and they can evaluate us. But if we're just going around anger and angry and bitter all the time towards somebody. Will we eventually, will we sin at times? Yes, we will sin at times. You ever been upset with somebody? Yeah, you get upset with somebody. But God's standard is, love them. This is Matthew 5, 21 and 22. Matthew 5, 27. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman and lusts after her, for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now he's going after a subject and he's going to do six times. This is what you heard. This is what I say. This is what you heard. This is what I say. Now, when Jesus really wants to speak with authority, his authority is, when he was being tempted by Satan, what did he say? It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone. And again, when he's tempted, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. When he speaks with authority, it is written. When the Pharisees and the Sadducees spoke, They didn't speak with authority. That's why Jesus, when he quoted them, he didn't say it is written because they're not even quoting scripture. They would say, well, you know, I know what the Bible says. I know what the law of Moses says, but here's what it really means. And and then they kind of lessen it up and give themselves some wiggle room. 
And so he says, you've heard it said, but I tell you. And now he's going to start with lust. Now, lust has to do with men and women and their relationships. God says, you know, lust ought to be out and love ought to be in. Lust can never wait to get. Love can wait for the right time to give. You hear the difference? Lust can never wait to get. Love can wait for the right time to give. Lust deals with what's going on in your heart and the sexual relationship. The next thing he talks about here, you've heard it said, he's going to talk about marriage. He's going to tie the two together. Back to back. So here's what he says in verse 31. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a written notice of divorce. But I tell you, everyone who divorces his wife, except in a case of sexual immorality, causes her to commit adultery. So now he's got lust. Now he's talking about marriage. The next thing he's going to talk about, you would think that Jesus is all over the map in this sermon. You think, oh, where's he going next? Man, he's, he's talking about murder. He's talking about lust. He's talking about marriage. He's talking about oaths but they all tie together, especially the lust. He says, you can be married, but when you're married, keep your word, whatever oath you say. And that's the next thing he's going to talk about. And so we get to our verse eventually here. He said, verse 31, it was said, but I tell you, verse 33, again, you have heard that it was said to our ancestors, you must not break your oath but you must keep your oaths to the Lord. Again, I'm going, when I was first reading this Sermon on the Mount, I'm going, man, he's talking about oaths and he's talking about marriage and he's talking about lust and he's talking about this and he's talking about that. Where is he going with this? Well, he's going with, you think your standard is high, but God's is really higher. And you've heard them tell you this, but I'm going to tell you. No. We're at the text today. And in our text today, it says this. Again, you have heard that it was said to our ancestors, you must not break your oath, but you must keep your oath to the Lord. I will tell you, Jesus is quoting the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He's not quoting scripture here because there's no specific scripture on the screen right now that he's quoting. But he said, you've heard it said because the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees take a little bit here, a little bit here, and a little bit here, and take what they like and make it palatable for the people, make it politically correct. And he says, but I'm going to tell you this. You've heard it said, but I tell you, don't take an oath at all, either by heaven because it is God's throne, or by the earth because it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem because it is the city of the great king. He goes on, neither should you swear by your head because you cannot make a single hair white or black. I said to the last service, yeah, this was before Claire all came in. You know, he just, he's going with what they understand. They couldn't change it back then. So he is right there and telling them, but let your word yes be yes. And your no be No. Anything more than this is from the evil one. So what is he talking about here? He said, I want you to learn to always tell the truth. Why do you need to take an oath to say, okay, I'm going to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Well, what have you been telling before this? (laughs) So what are you trying to do? You say, look... Where did the idea of oaths come from? Well, they came from the Lord. He's not saying oaths are bad. He's saying, when you take this oath, though, tell the truth. And by the way, he says, always tell the truth. Let your yes, if you're saying yes, mean it. And let it be yes. If you're going to say no, mean it. And say no. Don't don't say, no, I didn't have anything to drink, and I was you were out there bombed. Or, yes, we did everything right. Yes, I, I studied and, and I got ready for the test. And, and then you're cheating, you know, and re- doing somebody else's favor. If you say yes, 
I get yes. If you say no, I get no. So let me give you this kind of sermon in a sentence. God expects us to keep our word. Whether you take an oath or whether you don't take an oath. What does God expect? Now let me give you four questions to help you understand this text. Okay? First one is this. What did the law of Moses teach about oaths? I'm going to give you all four questions right now and then we'll go back and talk about them. Okay? What did the law of Moses teach about oaths? Because he gave it hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus. And there was a purpose for it. So what does he teach about oaths? Secondly, how did, uh, how had the Jewish people, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, how had they interpreted the law of Moses on this? Because the law of Moses wasn't bad. So how did the Jews interpret it so that Jesus said, wait a minute. You're not right on this. The third question I want you to look at is, what did Jesus teach about this abuse of oaths? Why did he say we need to change these things? And the last question I want you to answer is, did Jesus forbid us from taking oaths? I mean, we we say things... I, don't, I wouldn't say we say them all the time now. But you've heard somebody sometime in your life say, oh, no, no, hey, listen, this is the truth. I, I swear to God, it's the truth. You ever heard anybody say, I swear to God, it's the truth. I swear to God, he did it. Raise your hand if you've heard anybody say, I swear. To... Okay, you got the idea. Hey, you've heard some little kids say, cross my heart and hope to die. You've heard some adult and try to say, I'm really telling the truth. And he'll say, I swear on my mother's. And his mother is turning over in her grave when he says that. Oh, she's, she's not, obviously. But anyway, these four questions. So let's, uh, let's look at the first one. What did the law of Moses teach about oaths? Because Jesus is going to deal with this in the sermon. So it ought to be pretty important to them and to us. And what is he trying to say? Keep your word. Keep your word. Keep your word. What does the law of Moses say about oaths? By the way, the first time oaths are mentioned in Scripture, Genesis chapter 14. You have Melchizedek and Abraham. And they have an oath. And God has made oaths throughout Scripture. Angels have made oaths throughout Scripture. The Apostle Paul has made oaths throughout Scripture. Throughout his epistles. So what does it say? I'm going to give you three um, passages from the law of Moses. First one, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 12. You must not swear falsely by my name. What's interesting is uh, most of the time they kind of ignore this idea. uh, You must not take an oath is what we kind of end up saying. But what they were saying is you don't swear falsely. Now, let, let's be clear on this. When I look at kids here, most of the time they're thinking, when their parents say, hey, don't swear, stop swearing, stop. And when we, when we think of swearing, we think of cuss words. We think of, and so we, let's, let's separate the two words out. If we're talking about language that's unhealthy and unwholesome and ungodly, let's talk about cussing. They're, they're cussing. They're, uh, and when, when you take an oath, you're swearing, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth. That doesn't mean, we. it's bled over in our society. And words are always dynamic, and so the problem is when you're using a word like uh, you shouldn't swear, immediately all your minds go to, oh yeah, the word, uh, uh, a word like damn or a word like hell or a phrase like GD, you know, you spell it out and and. You know, he's not talking about that here. He's talking about the oath that you're taking. You're you're swearing to God. And it's a very solemn thing. And it's not, you know, something in this Old Testament passage that they're doing wrong. So here's what it says. You must not swear falsely by my name. Now, obviously, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. So let's just for a moment, when it was translated from Hebrew to Greek in about 300 B.C., and it became the Septuagint. The word that was used that we find both in our in our Greek today and in our Greek New Testaments is this word. Epi or keo. Epi or keo. And it means, when it says do not swear falsely, it means don't commit 
perjury. So if somebody gets on a stand and they say, I'm going to tell the truth, and they lie about it, we say, wow, he just perjured himself. And they end up and can go to jail or to prison, depending on probably the seriousness of the, of the case and the trial. You know, if I took a guy like, like Tim and, and you said that he murdered somebody and you said he murdered somebody and the two of you got together and say, hey, well, let's get Tim. I, we want him in prison. And you say, oh, I saw him do it. And two people in our, in our society, how many witnesses do we need to establish truth? What's Jesus say? In the mouth of two or three witnesses, truth will be established. Well, somebody else would say, no, wait a minute. His wife said, she, he was with me that night. His kids would say, he was with me. Some relative would say, he was with me. How could you know, you say he was there. We're trying to ascertain truth. It, it happens all the time in our society. There was a, a very wise school teacher um, for young wags. Do I call them wags? For young guys uh, decide they're going to cut school. They all jump in the car. They take off, have a great time, have fun together. They're out of school. And they say, man, we better get back before it's too late. They get back in the class. They get back there. But they say, let's tell the teacher we had a flat tire and that's why we you know, couldn't get here. And, and so they get back in school and they say, well, I saw when we had a flat tire. Oh, she said, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. You know, you need to make up this test that we took. Oh, okay, you know. They're gonna, they think, oh, God, we got away with it, you know. So she sets the four down. And she says, oh, I'm going to take the paper out, put your name on it. And she said, there's, there's only one question for the test. And here it is. Yeah, which tire went flat? <laughs> now, the guys were all on board, man. Yeah, we got by. Oh, but you got to ascertain the truth at times. And wisdom. And so here's what Jesus is saying. Look, don't perjure yourself. If You take an oath, but don't do it falsely. Don't say, you know, I swear that this really happened. And you're lying about it. Let me give you another verse on this. This is Leviticus 19.12. Let's go to Numbers chapter 30, verse 2. When a man makes a vow to the Lord or swears an oath... Did you notice there are two words that almost seem to be somewhat interchangeable? A vow and an oath. But they're not the same. And that's why he puts the two of them in the same verse and mentions them specifically. Now, did you notice the phrase, when a man, what's tied in with a vow? He makes a vow. But you... Take an oath. If you're going to be the president of the United States, what do you have to take before you're the president? The oath of the office. I'm going to ask the president to come and to take the oath of office now. So you make, and you can see, make right up there. When a man makes a vow. And by the way, God doesn't even force you to take either one. He doesn't say, you better make a vow on this. But he says, if you do vow, when you vow a vow to God, defer not to pay it. Pay what you vowed. God has no pleasure in what kind of people. Do you know what the word is? Fools. Fools. If you're going to vow to God, he says, follow through. So what's he say here? When a man makes a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to put himself under obligation, he must not break his word. So, you got to keep your word. He goes on, he must do whatever he has promised. I would say to you, for all the time I've been in ministry, and I was licensed in ministry in June of 1970. So, all that time in ministry, the thing I hear more than anything else, especially from young people, is my parents promised they would do this, and they didn't keep their word. What do your kids want to see? They want to see you keep your word. You're telling them that God keeps his word. You want your kids to keep their word. What do your kids want? You promised you would take us to Disneyland. And then you didn't do it. You promised this was going to happen. I'm saying to you, 
don't, you know, if you were to talk to our kids, uh, Doug is 32 today, Deanne's 29, if you were to talk to them, they would tell you, we never, we wouldn't say to them, I promise you it's going to happen. We would say to them, you know, unless God intervenes, somehow we'll plan on doing this. Now they know. Somebody can get sick. The car can break down. The park can close. <laughs> Who knows? But you you give them an opportunity. You you let them know how. What we don't want. What I don't want you to do is what my parents used to do, and you didn't like when your parents said it to you. Can we go here? Can we go here? Can we go here? We'll see. Okay, that's a no, huh? Uh, is that that? Did I interpret that right? That's a no. No, but it was always, we'll see. Well, it, it, that told me that they couldn't make a decision somehow or they, they d didn't want to do something that I wanted to do. If you want to do it, you know, say, hey, I'd love to do that with you. Unless God intervenes, you know, we, we're going to do it on this day. Or Okay, let's go back here. What are you saying? Must not break his word. He must do whatever he has promised. So what is the Old Testament standard? Go ahead, make the vow, but keep your word. He goes on in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 21. If you make a vow to the Lord your God, let me highlight that, do not be slow to keep it. Can I have you just read what's in yellow? If you make a vow to the Lord, keep it. That's always been the standard. That's what God is saying. When God speaks about your tongue, you need to listen. Why? Because James says it this way. In James chapter 3, verse 2, whoever can keep the tongue is a perfect person. The tongue is like a little member. that Just like the rudder is a little part of a big ship and can turn the whole ship, your tongue is like a little rudder. And it turns the events of your lives. Your tongue, James said, is like a fountain. And out of this fountain ought to come fresh water. It can't, don't have fresh water and bitter water coming out of the same place. So when he talks about your tongue, he said the, the man who can keep his tongue is a, what kind of a man? Perfect man. What does Jesus say in Matthew 5, 48? Be ye perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. So God is saying, get a hold of your tongue. Uh, Pastor Furman talked about it when he, when he was in Colossians chapter 3. Don't lie. There are some things you need to put off. There are some things you need to put to death. And so lying, you don't do that. So this is the Old Testament on that. Let's go uh, further now. God expects you to keep your word. And what are the questions? Well, here's what the Old Testament taught. Here's what the law taught. So how did the Jewish people interpret this law? It was always keep your word, always keep your word. So what did they do? They wanted to find some wiggle room so that you don't always need to keep your word in their thinking. So here's what the emphasis became for them. Well, they started out pretty well. I love this part. They started out well. Psalm 15, verses 1, 2, and 4. Lord, who can dwell in your tent? Who can live in your holy mountain? The one who... Keeps his word, whatever the cost. Let me give it to you in King James, because that's where I memorized it at first, and I really like it almost even better. It just kind of goes right across the grain. Here's what it says, King James. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. So you say... I'm going to do this. I learned this passage when I was oh, in in college. I said, okay, God, it's important when I make commitments, even if it's I swear to do something and then it's going to end up being my hurt, I change not. And then that summer I went to, to sell uh, Bibles, Nave Topical Bibles, door to door with uh, Southwestern. And so we were selling Bibles door to door and minutes, and I signed, I said, yeah. The guy said, we want you to work 75 hours a week. I said, I can do that, you know. 
give me that pen. I can sign right there, you know. And I made the commitment 75 hours a week. And then I got the mumps in the middle of summer. My dad said, in two weeks as a, as a 19-year-old. And it can be kind of a dangerous uh, thing to get at, as an adult. And so I, I said, okay. I called my dad. He said, ah, come on home. Forget that. I said, I can't. I gave my, I gave my word. He who swears to his own hurt and does what? Changes. Changes not. And that's what you want. Isn't that what you want in a husband? Isn't that what you want in a wife? She's going to be there for you. You're going to be there. Isn't that what you want when somebody says they're going to do something? You can count on it. God says, I want you to keep your word. They started out this way. They didn't stay that way. Look at what happens. And when they get in the New Testament, again, you have heard that it was said to our ancestors, you must not break your oath, but you must keep your oaths to the Lord. You don't have to worry about anybody else. Is what the Pharisees and the Sadducees started to say. What's it say? To the Lord. You've heard it said, as long as it's to the Lord, you can do that. Now, you can swear by other things. You can swear by heaven. You can swear by the earth. You can swear by Jerusalem. You can swear by the hair of your head. I don't care what you say. This is what the Pharisees were saying. But if you swear by the Lord, then you got to keep it. So they're trying to, they're, they're making these lesser and kind of exceptions. Let me give you another example because he's talking about this in Matthew chapter 5, but he jumps over and talks about it again up in Matthew chapter 23, verses 16 to 22, because they hadn't heard enough about oaths. And so here's what he says. Woe to you, blind guides who say, whoever takes an oath by the sanctuary, well, it means nothing. Hey, you can make an oath by the sanctuary and you don't need to keep it. It means nothing. And Jesus is going, really? But whoever takes an oath by the gold of the sanctuary is bound by his oath. So by the sanctuary, you don't need to keep it. By the gold of the sanctuary, you need to keep it. Well, what did Pharisees want anyway? The money, <laughs> the gold. It goes on in verse uh, 18. Also, whoever takes an oath by the altar, what's it mean? Nothing. But if you do it by the gift of the altar, then you have to keep your oath. What? what? Is that what the Old Testament taught? Not at all. The Old Testament taught, you give your word, you keep your word. Even though it slay you, you keep your word. Even though it costs you everything, keep your word. Some of you are saying, you know, you've been in a situation, a difficult situation, that you, you maybe lost your house. You lost it maybe in foreclosure and you think, oh, I, I, I don't know, I don't think, think I want to keep my word, but I couldn't keep my word. Can I, can I say this to you? We want you to keep your house and we want you to make your payments. But if you've lost your house in a foreclosure and the bank got the house back, talking to a bank or two, <laughs> you you, you kept your word. If I can't make the payment, you get the house. Is it what you wanted to do? No, you wanted to keep the payments. The bank entered into an agreement with you, a financial agreement, an investment on their part and your part. If the house went up in value and you couldn't afford it, the bank got it and they sold it for more. If the bank went down, or if the house went down in value, and you lost your job, your husband died, or your, your breadwinner died in your family. A lot of times people uh, lose their homes in foreclosure when a spouse or a family member dies like that. And your word was, if I can't make the payments, you get the house back. You want to keep your word. I'm not suggesting don't make your payments. God's word says, you know, owe no man anything but love. So you don't go out and create debt and get into that kind of thing, but you always keep your word. What do the Pharisees say? Well, you don't always have to keep your word except when you pledge to the Lord, when you make a vow to the Lord. So how did Jesus deal with that? Well, Jesus says, I always expect you to keep your word. So what did Moses teach? Always keep your word. What did the uh, Sadducees and the Pharisees teach? Uh, there are exceptions. What did Jesus do then? 
Jesus teach about this abuse of oaths. I'm putting on the screen the same verse that the Pharisees and the Sadducees said, and their difference was any vow you make to the Lord, you have to keep. So how did Jesus deal with that? Because then the Pharisees had to give, well, what if you want to make other vows, other oaths? Well, then they started making oaths by heaven and oaths by earth. Oh, I, I, you know, may heaven hold me accountable, you know, and blah, 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 make the oath. Or by Jerusalem or by the hairs of your head. And so here's what Jesus said to them. But I tell you, don't take an oath at all, either by heaven because it is God's throne or by the earth because it is his footstool or by Jerusalem because it is the city of the great king. Neither should you swear by your head because you cannot make a single hair white or black. So what does he say? Heaven, who owns heaven? God does. The earth, who owns the earth? God does. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness therein. Jerusalem is the city of God. How about you? Your white hair or your black hair? Or what? Who owns you? God. So what he's saying here is, look, everything belongs to the Lord. And you're trying to make it so that if I make a vow, if I make it by heaven, then it has something not to do with God. Or if I make it by earth, it has something not to do with God. And if you make it by uh, Jerusalem, it has nothing to do with God. God has everything. So if I jump from here over to Matthew chapter 23 again, it says this. We read verse 16 already. Woe to you blind guides who say, whoever makes an oath by the sanctuary, it means nothing. But whoever takes an oath by the gold of the sanctuary, is bound by the oath. You blind fools. For which is greater, the gold or the sanctuary that sanctified the gold? It all belongs to the Lord. He goes on in the text. Also, whoever takes an oath by the altar, it means nothing you say. But whoever takes an oath by the gift that is on it is bound by his oath. Oh, blind people. For which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift? Therefore, the one who takes an oath by the altar takes an oath by it and by everything on it. The one who takes an oath by the sanctuary takes an oath by it and by him who dwells in it. And the one who takes an oath by heaven takes an oath by God's throne and by him who sits on it because everything belongs to the Lord. So, the last question. The last question was, is God telling us not to take oaths then? Here's the question. Did Jesus forbid us from taking oaths? And what's the text say? But I tell you, don't take an oath at all. They say, well, he's telling us not to take an oath. There are some denominations that don't take oaths. They didn't even allow their people when, and uh, and I was told, Tim, maybe you can clarify this, that in uh, courtrooms today, they don't have people taking oaths anymore. I swear to tell the truth, do they? So help me God. So they still take the oath without God. I, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who else is it? It's my word. I, I'm making, I, what am I swearing by there? Nothing but me, right? Uh, otherwise, it's so help me God. God hold me accountable. I'm swearing that God can judge me if I don't. But otherwise, if I take a vow, the only one I'm pledging to is me. Follow that? So he says, I tell you, don't take an oath at all. But does the sentence end there? Do you see that? No, the sentence doesn't end there. And so he says this way, either by heaven or by earth or by Jerusalem or by your head. All those statements are qualifiers. Don't take an oath by heaven. Don't take an oath by the earth or by Jerusalem or by your head. It all belongs to God. 
So these are, and I'll just put it on the screen. These are all just qualifiers. I want to qualify. Don't take an oath unless it's by the Lord. Don't take it by heaven or by this or by that or by that. Now, let me even be more clear on this. Let's go back, wipe this all clean. Use the same text again. But I tell you, don't take an oath at all. Here is the focus that most people want to end the sentence at. But let me put the Greek on the screen. This is the Greek that was used. And what's interesting about that Greek, when we look at the Greek text, when we look at the English text, there are times when somebody says for you to do something, you know whether it's a request. When you say to somebody, would you please uh, bring the car around for somebody? Is that a command or a request? It's a request. Would you please do this? If you look at somebody and say, look, Go get the car. Hey, I'm commanding you. Go get the car and bring it around here so that... Now, what's the difference? One's a request and one's a a command. In Greek, the words carry... Specifically, we can say that's an imperative and that's a command. And what you need to know about this text is that there is not one single command in this verse. There's not one Greek imperative. He is not commanding you to do, not to take oaths. It's not a command. So how is he, when when he translate this text, when you really look at it, he's almost saying, this is what I say. You not swear at all by heaven or earth. Or he's saying, look, why do you even need to swear by these things? Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. He's not commanding that you can't do it. If you want to become the president of the United States, get up there and take that oath if you want to, you know. Just glorify God. If if he's called you to do it and you're going to do it, glorify God. If you don't have to swear, you know, by heaven or God or anything else, just say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defend and protect the Constitution of the United States from enemies, foreign and domestic. I said I was going to do it. I'm going to do it. You keep your word. Because what's God wants us to do? Keep our word. But other people that don't keep their word are called liars. And just so you know, in the end, by the way, let me throw this in as well. When I said, does God forbid us to take oaths? God himself took an oath in Hebrews chapter 6 after he taught this. I said to you, Paul took oaths in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23. He said, I swear to God, the reason I didn't come by, God is my witness. I didn't come by because I didn't want to create greater heartache to you. Paul swore. Bad language again. You know, he just vowed that he wouldn't do this. The angels, the angel in Revelation made an oath. Jesus, before the Sanhedrin, answered. They put put him under, I adjure you before God. I ask you to swear before God that you are, and he answered them under oath. What are they teaching? Always tell the truth. By the way, I'll give you one other thing. Uh, Twice this passage of scripture comes up comes up. Do not take an oath. Twice it comes up in scripture. This passage I just told you, no command in it. The other time it comes up is in James chapter 5 verse 12. And by the way, there is a command in the Greek there. Not to take an oath. I haven't studied that, so I'm not going to... I'd tell you why, uh, but uh, I don't know right offhand, you know, why he used that particular uh, Greek command. Not to take an oath. But James has just taught about the tongue in James chapter 3 and how much problems it gets into. But where do liars go? People that don't keep their word? Here's what God's word says, Revelation 21, 8. But the cowards, unbelievers, vile, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and what kind of people? All liars. Their share will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. So what happens to liars? They happen to go to the lake of fire 
Now, I don't know anybody that's never lied. So does that mean you go to like a fire? Well, if you haven't trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, <laughs> you might as well be right with the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the adulterers, the murderers, the... They're people without Christ. But you can have Christ in your life today. You can have forgiveness. And you can go to heaven. But the question that I would have for you today is, are you going to stand, you know, by your word and, and not lie? glorify God with the truth if you're telling lies John 8 44 says this you are of your father the devil but when you trust Christ as your savior he said you have the right to become the sons of God so become a child and have a new father. God. Let's ask God to help us keep our word. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for giving us insights. Help us to be obedient to what you reveal today. Help us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.